I like to begin uh, with introducing Noma's stroll coordinator um, and Inwood's own Martin Collins, um, who, as always, has a special statement to share with all of us tonight and who will kick off our evening. Martin. Good evening, Naria. Good evening, Michelle, Joanna, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us on this edition of Thursdays with Noma and artist Rachel Sidlowski, powered tonight by Carrot Top Pastries since 1979, serving Washington Heights, Inwood, and beyond at 3931 Broadway, West 165th Street. For over four decades, Carrot Top Pastries has been the go-to place for Northern Manhattan and just about anyone who enjoys not only carrot cake, but delicious baked goods, pies, and uh, a variety of other delicious uh, cuisine that the Carrot Top family brings. It's wonderful founder, owner, the late Renee Mancino, has uh, been a great friend to the community and to the Uptown Art Stroll for many, many years. And uh, Carrot Top Pastries continues. And now it's fifth decade with uh, the Mancino family, her husband Bob and her children. And there we have a picture of the uh, co-naming of 214th Street and Broadway. Carrot Top's original location back in 1979 at Broadway and West 214th Street. They opened their uh, location at Broadway and 165th Street in 1984. And we are so very proud and uh, honored to have Carrot Top Pastries power tonight's Thursdays with Noma and Rachel Sidlowski. Naria? Wonderful, thank you so much, Martin. And we are so happy to promote Carrot Top Pastries uh, tonight. Uh, good evening to all of you. My name is Neria Leva Gutierrez and I am Acting Executive Director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. And as always, I'm so happy to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us um, and helping us honor and celebrate our incredibly vibrant Uptown community. Um, and before we begin, I wanted to give special thanks to Charter Spectrum, who has generously funded this program and our series, in fact, uh, and we are very grateful to them. Um, over the course of these uh, 21 weeks or so, and that's how long we've been uh, doing this, it seems like we've gone through so much together. And for those of you who have been with us um, since the beginning, I see Regina and I see Elizabeth, um, it, it certainly feels that way. Uh, the world feels like it's at once standing still and moving along at breakneck speed. Um, and there, of course, has been a great deal of loss as well. Just today, we learned that Jim Dwyer passed of lung cancer. He was, of course, a uh, reporter for the New York Times uh, and a longtime Washington Heights resident. Um, and you can listen to his interview for uh, the New York Public Library's Oral History Project online, in which he talks about um, the neighborhood and the changing, changing demographics over time. And so we think um, about his family tonight as well as we are all um, together and we are uh, collectively um, a part of, of this community. Um, but one of my most favorite things about this program and about these programs is how much great stuff is revealed over the course of an hour. It's really a treat to get to speak to our artists, to learn about them in such meaningful and intimate ways. Um, and all of you, of course, um, with your questions, um, with your insights help facilitate this. And so uh, we are so grateful to all of you for being here tonight. And we ask that as always, and for those of you who are joining, joining us for the first time, you deposit your questions throughout the course of the evening uh, into the chat um, box so that we can address them as the night goes on. And I know Rachel um, is willing and excited to be able to answer those questions. And so I'd like to get going. Um, Rachel Sidlowski, a longtime resident of Inwood, was born in Newport, Rhode Island and raised in Providence. These cities, both in their post-industrial landscape and their collection of historic homes, served as early influences and points of inquiry in Rachel's artistic processes. Her childhood home was within walking distance of the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, the Providence Antineum, and several historic house museums. The city's rich architecture, along with the period rooms at the RISD Museum and their contemporary collection, were among some of her earliest memories of engaging with art. 
Rachel also lived in Boston while pursuing her undergraduate degree from Tufts University and the Museum School of Fine Arts, go Jumbos. Uh, and she worked as an usher at Symphony Hall. Um, a production potter and as a baker. She also taught art at the high school level for three years at Cambridge Ringed and Latin a Public High School in Cambridge, Massachusetts before moving to New York City. Her first jobs in the city included teaching ceramics at Chambers Pottery in Tribeca and at the Children's Art Carnival in Harlem. She received two graduate degrees from the City University of New York, an MA in Art Education from City College, and an MFA in Printmaking from Lehman College. She is also a Bronx Artist in the Marketplace alum and is currently the Department Chair of Art at East Chester High School. Since 2012, she has exhibited widely in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and all over New York. She has been quite busy uh, just this year alone. She counts seven exhibitions among her recent output. She has also curated a variety of exhibitions, including several at the New York Public Library branches, and she has received numerous prestigious grants and fellowships, most recently one from the Citizens Community for New York City Neighborhoods. In addition to being an Inwood resident, she is also deeply invested in the neighborhood, having become interested in its history after picking up Gore Vidal's historic novel, Burr, which spurred an interest in learning more about Burr's second wife, Eliza Jamel. This interest in historical fiction and in the history of New York City led her to exhibitions at the Morris Jamel Mansion, Wave Hill, and a forthcoming installation entitled Assembly of Ciphers, opening at Dykeman Farmhouse, and which investigates the stories of enslaved people belonging to the Dykeman family and the surrounding community of Inwood. And we look forward to hearing about that um, tonight. She is also well known to Noma, having exhibited in its Women in the Heights exhibition two times in 2014 and 2017, exhibitions she cites as a bridge to meeting and connecting with a wide variety of artists in the uptown community. For Rachel, pattern in her work is key. It's an extension of power, it's the taming of nature, and it's the trick of the eye. It also transforms the unadorned into the fanciful and sometimes even the opulent. Taking her cues from the Gilded Age interior spaces, gardens, and America vernacular architecture, she appropriates motifs, decorative objects, and flora and fauna using screen printing as her primary medium. These large-scale installations which dialogue with the past and which we'll learn about tonight are magnificently informed by history and by memory. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight our featured artist, Rachel Sedlowski. Rachel. Thank you, Nuria. That was really, really lovely. And I also want to thank Noma for having me here tonight. Um, and really a formal thank you because I feel in a sense that really um, my artistic career started here in New York City and Noma has been so supportive of Uptown Artists. And I remember those early shows were such a wonderful way of meeting with other artists and making friends um, in the Uptown, uh, you know, Upper Manhattan. So um, this is just a formal thank you. Um, I'm really honored to be here tonight. And I've prepared a short film that will show you a little bit about my processes and influences. So without further ado, let's take it away. I'm Rachel Sidlowski and I'm a visual artist. I use printmaking and decorative objects to create large scale installations. When you tell people from outside the city that you live in Manhattan, I think they have this preconceived notion of what your neighborhood is like. I think they picture Times Square and the streets filled with taxis, people rushing to work. But Inwood isn't really like that at all. It's sort of like you're living in a town that's within a city at the edge of the woods surrounded by water. It's a really unique and magical place. There's a lot of nature, but it's also mixed with many hallmarks of an urban environment and the services that support the day-to-day -day life in a city of millions of people. Where you live can have a strong influence over what you make and your creative process. I think that statement is really true for me. 
I'm always searching out these rare moments in the cityscape, the intersection of humans and the natural world, and where the past pushes through to the present. Having the opportunity to share what I make with the public is one of the best motivations for me to keep working. This installation titled Keeping Room was presented last winter through Chishama and curated by Laura James. The location was in the empty DOT building at Fordham Road and Webster Avenue across the street from the Metro North Station. It was a bit of a challenge to construct this large scale screen print collage because I didn't have the luxury of working in the space over a long period of time. I had to engineer it in a way so that it could be quickly installed. I prepared each panel in my studio and each section was about 12 feet by three feet. The height of each panel exceeded past the height of the walls of my studio. So I had to work on the top section first and then hang the panels from the beams in the ceiling so I could complete the bottom. In the end, the whole 12 by 22 foot installation rolled up into something I could easily carry on the train or throw into the trunk of a cab. This way of working is very adaptable to living in the city. It's light and a huge installation can be taken down and rolled up in no time at all. My studio is located in the Andrew Smith Carpet Mills Complex. Every time I come to the studio, it reminds me of the post-industrial landscape of New England where I grew up. And I feel really at home in this kind of environment. I didn't have a studio for a long time and I would kind of beg, steal or borrow space and equipment. It was really hard. Having a studio now feels like this huge luxury, but also a necessity. When I have multiple projects going on at once or I'm preparing for an exhibition, the studio can get really crazy because I use so many types of materials. The prints alone, there are thousands of them and keeping them organized is a challenge in itself. When I'm working, the floor is often full of scraps and the tables are covered. It's a bit of a controlled chaos. After a project is done or when installations get returned to the studio, I reorganize and put everything in its place until the process starts again. The prints I use in my installation are screen printed, which is a process in itself. And I'm gonna to try to explain a little bit of it. The first step is to create a stencil. There are many ways of doing this, but I mostly create digital renderings in Photoshop and print them out on clear film from a large format printer. Then I coat a screen with a thin layer of photosensitive emulsion. This has to be done using safe lights in a dark room. After the emulsion dries, I take the stencil and place it on the exposure unit. I know I should leave more room between the edge of the screen and the stencil, but I try to maximize the physical limitations of the screen and the exposure unit. The screen is then exposed to light, not the yellow light you see here, which will not expose the screen, but light that will react with the photosensitive emulsion. The area that is not blocked by the image on the stencil will become hard. The area that is blocked will stay soft and be able to be washed out with water. This washout sink also has safe lights, so I don't have to rush when I'm developing the screen. You can see the areas that have not been exposed to light as they're a little lighter in color and they look something like the stencil that was on the exposure unit. These are gonna to start to wash out and you can already see the emulsion in these areas is starting to break up a little bit, leaving that part of the screen even lighter and open. This is where the print and ink will be able to pass through, rendering an image. The darker areas will block the ink and prevent the ink from passing through the screen. After this process, I allow the screen to dry in natural light outside of the dark room. After it dries, I'm ready to print. Screen printing is a process. It takes time to get all your materials together. It's even a considerable time investment to develop a screen. I think it turns a lot of people off. But I'm drawn to the indirect processes and the way images can be reproduced multiple times. I feel like printmaking has so many applications beyond the traditional processes, it never gets old for me. Now I'm ready to mix my printing ink with transparent base, tape up my screen, and print. I print a lot and I usually do most of my printing alone. So I've come up with some efficient ways to make multiples by threading a roll of paper across the table. I just continuously print. You can see I've suspended this roll of paper 
with a rope and ladder, it's not exactly something you're going to see other printers do, but it works for me. After printing, I'm ready to start cutting the prints out. I use both scissors and an X-Acto knife. It's really nice when friends stop by and cut with me. Everybody has their own style of cutting, and when I'm collaging from a pile of prints, sometimes I can even tell who cut them. I'm not sure I consider myself a printmaker, at least not in the traditional sense. Rather, I use printmaking as a vehicle to create environments that are rich in pattern and repetition. I'm also really interested in decorative objects like ceramics and furniture, and I'll often incorporate them into installations. This is a set of a stop motion animation that I made for Empty Set, which is a space that supports experimental and new work. It was made in April of the past year, and I decided to try my hand at stop motion since the whole city was shut down because of COVID. The city was so quiet and strange, I replicated the experience with this uncanny interior space. This is part of the stop motion animation titled Slow Spring, which is really made from parts of previous works. And in this way, I feel lucky that I'm able to reuse elements from previous installations to create something new. This process, I think, has really helped me create and develop an identifiable visual vocabulary through using some of the same prints and objects in different projects. I don't want to give the impression that I work entirely alone because I don't. Some of these artworks are very labor intensive and often there's a short timeline. I do work with assistants occasionally, but I also rely on an ever expanding network of friends and contacts. Whether it's having someone lend me a hand to install or reaching out to someone for technical advice, it's like never a solo act. I'm always trying something new and expanding my network of friends and support system. In my current project, I'm working with a fashion designer, an upholsterer, an electrician, and I've already enlisted the help of several friends. And finally, I wanted to leave you with these images from Art Off Screen, organized by Eileen Jang Lynch, which I installed at the William Hurst House on Park Terrace East this past July. I also just wanna take this moment to thank everyone for all the positive feedback and kindness I received and let you know that I aim to create more public art this fall. That is wonderful. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And I, and I love that promise of creating more public art. Um, you know, this, this theme of creating environments um, is so fascinating to me. And with this ever-changing environment, um, you know, I think it, it's so interesting. It'd be so interesting to hear from you about, you know, that concept of, of when environments change and the intersection between the built environment and the physical environment. Um, and then even this isolated environment and, and, and how that sort of feeds your work. Um, I also, you know, this idea of, of the, your behind the scenes, you know, there's something so interesting about how intricate your work is and how um, beautiful and the repetition of pattern and design and, and, um, and then the sort of, as you say, the chaos behind it. Um, and then how you can just kind of wrap it up and what almost looks like a yoga mat bag, you know, and sort of take it into the city. Uh, you know, I find all of those um, fascinating. And so I know that we have questions tonight and I want to um, open up uh, the floor for, to those questions. Um, and we have tonight uh, Joanna Castro, who is here, um, who is the consultant for special projects at NOMA um, and who I know knows you well um, also, uh, who is going to moderate our discussion. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Joanna. Um, Joanna. Thank you, Nadia. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Oh, my God. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Oh, and I'm drinking water, by the way, just, just in case anyone's wondering. Um, <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Rachel, it's great to see you again, even if it's virtually. Someday we will meet again. Um, so please, folks, feel free to um, write your questions in the chat box. We are getting a lot of great comments. Um, uh, Elizabeth, a wonderful video uh, about the process. And I can't help but wonder if that, that teacher and you, Rachel, came out 
as you were explaining, it was so detailed and, and really covering almost any question that would come up. Can you talk to us about how, um, how you created the video? Did you have a script? Was it just, okay, uh, I'm just gonna see how it goes? Did you do a couple of takes? Um, I started collecting videos. I just started making like little videos with my iPhone in the preceding weeks before I had like the due date in my calendar for the video. And I'm, I don't really know iMovie that well. I've had to make instructional videos for school um, you know, at work and, uh, and I've been forced to use it more since we've, we've all been in like this digital realm for like, you know, the past half a year or so. Um, so I just started collecting videos and I created, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit uncomfortable when I'm doing a recorded video with just speaking because I feel like I'll go off on tangents. So what I would do is I would have my images and then I would write like a short script and just have it in front of me so I could do the voiceover. But sometimes I would go off script a little bit, but I tried to stick to the point um, because I wanted to explain the process and just a little bit about where I'm coming from as an artist. But I feel like that process uh, is complicated. And for people who know screen printing, it's elementary. They're like, why are you explaining this to me? But for people who don't know screen printing, um, it's very confusing and even, um, Sometimes even when I explain what I do um, to other artists, they, you know, who maybe don't really, they don't understand exactly what I'm doing. So I felt like the video was a good way just to demystify the process. And also I love showing the messes and sort of like the ugly part behind making things because as an artist, you see all that grossness and difficulties um, and work. And for people who are viewing the work, they just see sort of the finished project, was which is really an illusion. Um, but there's, there's all these moments of struggle and mess and frustration sometimes and things not working out. And I just wanted to share that because it's very, I think it's something that a lot of artists go through, but maybe they don't really show it as much. So I try to be honest about what I do in my work and just be very truthful, um, yeah. So I created a script, I had a lot of videos, I had a, a rough idea, um, and then it just sort of all came together. Okay, thank you, Rachel. So Liliessa is offering herself to cut your prints. So you have a, a helper. Girl, you gotta email me. <laughs> yeah, Anytime. so we'll be, we'll be giving you, uh, giving folks your social media handles so if they wanna um, follow you. Um, they can do so. Um, so I think one of our first questions comes from Dionis Ortiz. Dionis, are you with us? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Uh, would you like to um, ask your question, please? Oh man, my, my Wi-Fi is not the greatest right now. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, what, what, what was the last thing you said? Um, if you want to give us your question, the one that, that you typed in the chat. Oh, sure. Well, um, Rachel, what's your relationship to the patterns that you incorporate into your work? First of all, I just want to say hi, Deanna. Hey. It's been forever. I um, know. I know. So Deanna <laughs> and I worked together at the Children's Art Carnival like ages ago, mm -hmm. ages ago. I'm so happy to see you. Oh, my gosh. Um, Same here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm definitely like a maximalist when it comes to art. I, I, I'm really interested in pattern. I think if I hadn't been a teacher, I probably should have been like a wallpaper designer. And I just love this idea of um, pattern, but that pattern also can be subverted and it can, it can, you can sort of like hide things in it or it can be an illusion. So I think this process evolved um, when I was in graduate school at Lehman um, my professor, Melissa Brown, I took a screen printing course with her and people were making like discrete prints, like prints you could hang on the wall or like artist books or whatever. And I was like, okay, like that's cool. I like that, but I'm not really interested in art that would go in a gallery or art that, you know, would be in a flat file. I want to do something that's more environmental or possibly public or something a little bit mm. more renegade. So you know, it kind of evolved from like this modular thing. I was like, okay, so if I take this print 
and then I make like a billion of them. Like what, like how far can they go? Like, what can I do with them? Um, so I started just like, actually I started with like clip art from, um, one of these like historical books that like a taxonomy of, um, classical art. And I would take them and put them in Photoshop and augment them and make them sort of like fit together. So, um, so I would start to create these environments. And then from there, I was doing research for the Wave Hill project, which she's showing right now. And I connected with the librarian um, at the New York Botanical Garden. And she led me to some really wonderful resources that had historical illustrations some from hundreds of years ago and some that are a little bit more recent. So I started messing around with those and creating my own patterns from them digitally. And I really got into Photoshop, like probably a little too deep, but <laughs> you know, that's where I create the stencils. But it's interesting because like this image right here probably has maybe, I don't know, like six or seven different stencils. And I might flip the stencil so I get like the opposite for it as okay. well. Um, but the way that you cut them and print them and my prints are like very imperfect so you get like this modulation of color and sometimes they're not i know you're a printmaker too so you know what i'm talking about like sometimes you'll mm -hmm. print it but it won't be perfect but like right. where it kind of skips out or like there's too much transparent base or something like that, you get like this yeah. modulation in color so you're able to make just a few prints look like many many different prints you know right. From them or whatever. So that's where it started. But I think I really, you know, because of because of my childhood growing up in Rhode Island um, and growing up in all these really big ornate homes that were basically made by people who were like either made a ton of money like um, in whale oil or slave trading or these other nefarious activities you know, they would try to cement their, um, their social, their place in like this social strata by having these really elaborate homes, but it sort of hid the more, some of their, their activities, you know, like they seemed like they could travel and play society, but maybe they were really like a pirate or they were like out, you know, stealing, I don't know, like cargo from another country. Um, so those things like always really interested me, the way that people can use decorative objects to be accepted into society and have it sort of like be an elude or be a distraction from who they really are. Cool. Right. Awesome. The work looks beautiful. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it looks incredible. It looks amazing. I really enjoy looking at it. Thanks for coming tonight. I'm so of happy. Of course. <laughs> oh, man, that was great. That was wonderful. Great to see that Uptown Connection. Um, we have another assistant in the wings. Um, so if you need two cutters, you have Lilia and Liz Ritter, uh, Rachel. And uh, Liz has the next question. Um, your process is really complicated and involved and detailed, and I'm just wondering, like, how did you come up with that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I have to assume it was somewhat iterative, evolutionary, but like, how did you figure out that, oh, this is how I'm going to do this? Well, I think, you know, it's like a really long evolution because before I started printmaking, I was, I was more invested in ceramics. Um, and that was always a little bit easier when I lived in, when I lived in Boston, it was like a, a kinder city to something that was heavy and required a lot of space. Um, and then in New York, it became really, really difficult. So actually this image right here is the first large installation I did. And I did it, I don't know if any, probably many- Is that the gardener? Is it what? It looks like the gardener. Uh, it's a it's a space at Lehman College and it's based very loosely on Untermeyer Garden mm -hmm. in Yonkers. So um, I I really I really I really kind of thought thought more that I was more comfortable in the realm of sculpture than I would than I would be in drawing or painting. Um, so 
it seemed natural to me to take something that was flat and like create an environment from it. And I also am not super excited about the idea of passive art, you know, just walking by something. I like the idea that you can engage or walk through an environment or be really surprised by something that um, is somewhere where you really wouldn't expect it. And I think the city is nice for that because there's a lot of these little, you know, for example, like the piece uh, I did over the summer at um, on Park Terrace East, where there was uh, that the boarded up door and I just created this, uh, it was just like a, a very small piece. It was just like the size of the doorway where I was able to create um, sort of an uninspected environment that people would stumble onto and hopefully be pleased by, but I was a little actually concerned that I was gonna get a ticket for vandalism, <laughs> which didn't end up happening and I'm so happy about that. But um, I, I really just stumbled onto it as a way of, of adapting to living and working in New York City as an artist because ceramics was just, it was just too much. It was like this back breaking, expensive, heavy kind of thing. When I found prints, um, I just found it to be really liberating because it could, everything could just be sort of like rolled up and carried. It's very light um, and it could be expanded to fit any to fit any space at all. And as a matter of fact, sometimes I've been invited to show in, and someone says, oh, I like this installation. Can you put this installation in this space? And the space is like completely different size, different <laughs> building, different circumstances. Even if it's like, uh, one time it was like a glass front, um, like a the front of a store uh, in this MFA show in 2014. And luckily, because they're modular, like things, it just works out. Like things can really fit anywhere. So I think really it was just a reaction to living in the city and finding a medium that was engaging for me, but also something that was very adaptable and basically inexpensive. I mean, it's just paper and ink and a lot of cutting. <laughs> that was a good question though. It's a great answer. Thank you, Liz. And now I think we have a question from Nidia. Here I go. Um, so one of the things I think is so interesting, um, and it's come up a few times in your discussion and, and, and in sort of your insights, um, is this idea of, of the sort of subversive nature um, of, of, of what you do, right? This sort of, you know, kind of this, sort of, you know, very visually pleasing, ornate, just well-appointed, um, you know, installation, and then that sort of underbelly that you were kind of trying to figure out. Talk to me a little bit about that subversive piece, because I find that fascinating. And then maybe also tell us a little bit about the changing environment. So, you know, you've done Rhode Island, you've done Boston, you've done New York, you've done New York in COVID. So, you know, Talk to us a little bit about that in, in, in your brain and, and how it's sort of informing your process. And like I said, you know, you've been really active um, this year, which is also fascinating. Um, so I think the, subver the subversive um, aspect of the print of the, you know, of my process probably does stem from um, and it, of growing up in Providence. And it's true of Providence, but it's probably true of most cities where, um, you know, there's a level of co corruption and sort of like a criminal under underbelly. And sometimes the people who are leaders or in charge are also involved maybe in both worlds. Um, and as a child, I saw that firsthand on many different levels. Um, some of it was his, like reckoning with history and some of it was actually sort of like firsthand um, observations of perhaps like the parents of people that I grew up with or figures in the community who presented themselves one way, but I had knowledge just from being an observer that perhaps they weren't that way. Um, and these were people who were maybe well respected. I'm not going to name any names, but um, you know, and that was something that I think every child faces at some point that things aren't what they seem. Um, and I've just I've just carried that with me, but in the same time, it's like very fascinating to me. Uh, and we continue to do that, I think, throughout history, 
even today, like when you think about like the Sacklers, you know, and I remember when I lived in Boston, I would walk by the Sackler Museum every single day on the way to work, you know, and there's this family that people are um, respecting and they have a lot of sway in the community, but, you know, later on things, people find out some other things about the family and things change. So this shifting of histories is something that I'm really interested in. Um, and America is probably such a such a wonderful place for reversals of fortune, for stories of reversals of fortune, um, which is another reason I was so interested in Eliza Jamel because she actually, she grew up in Rhode Island. And at one point she was um, in the poorhouse because her mother couldn't take care of her. And the poorhouse was located, formerly located in um, the Brown University athletic field, which was right behind my house. So I just felt this like strange connection with her, but that she had really made good for uh, basically an orphan from Rhode Island who like ran away um, and had done quite well. Maybe she wasn't the best person in the world, but her story was really intriguing to me. And also that I felt Rhode Island was sort of a hard place to come out of. Um, and sort of escape some of the darker forces there. So, um, so I guess that's where the subversive nature comes from, um, or thinking about subversion and uh, sort of like the underbelly of society. And I think my work does present itself in a very polite way, but you have to just stick with it beyond the beauty a little bit, and there's more there. Um, yeah, and what was the other part of the question? Well, I, I was I was interested in and and it's and it's so true. Like I love I love this idea of I mean I think just by virtue of um you know the fact that you you want to show process, right? I think that that in and of itself is is subversive. I mean that's that's the modern kind of, you know, that's the the impulse of the modern artist, right? To not just show the polished, finished, licked canvas version, but it's also showing like the behind the scenes, right? And mm. we are such legacies of, of that idea. But you've had shifting environments, right? And so, you know, you, you've done the Providence, you've done Boston, and now you're in New York, but now you're in New York in COVID. So how has that environment, um, because you're such a, a student of the environment, um, what has that presented to you in, in terms of challenges or inspiration or both? Well, I was, like you said, I was very, I had a very good year last year in terms of having opportunities, but it was actually, I work full time. I'm a high school teacher. Um, it was getting a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> so I was trying to meet the demands of all these opportunities that were coming up because in a sense, I felt probably like many other artists feel sometimes that when you're presented with an opportunity, you have to take it. Um, you don't wanna let things pass. So I was sort of trying to do it all. Um, when COVID happened, to be totally honest, it was a horrible thing, but I was a little bit relieved because everything slowed down a lot. I was just feeling like life was like a little bit out of control and I didn't really feel like I could keep up with it, but I was, but I was doing it. Um, and there were a few things coming up that got postponed. There's actually a big um, corporate installation that is gonna, I can't say with whom, but um, it's coming up. It was supposed to be installed in March and that was postponed. And I was actually just like, oh, thank God, you know, like I can just take a breather and do a really good job with this and present it how I want to present it. Um, and then everything just shifted. Like I got, a I got the opportunity to try stop motion animation because I had another project planned for empty set, but I didn't have access to certain equipment and I couldn't, I couldn't go there. I couldn't do certain things. I was supposed to have a show in the space in the South Bronx, but um, I, you know, I just couldn't. So I ended up doing something in my studio that was completely different that was hosted digitally. So there's like this whole digital realm that became a new landscape that I hadn't really thought about or was interested in. But now I, I'm very much warming up to that. Um, and then there was an opportunity through um, Art Off Screen where Eileen Jang Lynch contacted me and said, oh, you know, do you want to do something, this, this project that I'm doing, it's artists all over the world and they're doing artwork that can be viewable by the general public without having to go into a space. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. I was like, that's wonderful. And 
I love Inwood so much and there's so many great spaces here. Um, but I really love the William Hurst house a lot. Like I really want to go inside. I just dream about that house all the time. And I also dream about like what things it could be in the future. Um, it's such an intriguing space to me. And I love that portico and that doorway. So I knew right away when she emailed me, I was like, I, I was like, I know exactly what I'm going to do. Um, and I had the extra prints and I didn't need to make anything new. So I really just disassembled old installations to create this new installation. Um, and it's so basically like I glue the prints on Tyvek and they're just paper. It's looking a little beat up in this photo. I think it's probably, it was probably up for quite some time. <laughs> and we had some very stormy days, um, but I was surprised it held up pretty well. I would walk by every day and just see to make sure it hadn't fallen down because I didn't want to use anything permanent because I hadn't asked permission uh, to put this up. So I just got some industrial Velcro and stuck it to um, the bricked up uh, doorway and then had Velcro on the back of the Tyvek. And surprisingly, it stayed up for over a month. So I was really happy about that. So, you know, in short, I think the changing landscape of how we're able to go out and how we're able to interact with people um, and the gallery, going out to galleries or museums isn't quite what it used to be. Everything's sort of changing. So you just have to roll with it kind of. Like I don't, we wouldn't be doing this if COVID hadn't have happened. So, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity and I think also that I've been able to connect with people that I wouldn't have otherwise. So it's sort of like this silver lining in a really horrible, situation. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, no, I think it's that notion of, um, I mean, that's, you know, that's the, that's the creative spirit, right? It's sort of, you know, trying to, to find those spaces um, for where you can express yourself, you know? Um, so uh, Joanna, I, I don't know if you have another question there that you wanted to uh, address. Joanna, you frozen? I have a few I want to oh, uh, give Regina her, her time. Yes, yeah, so um, Regina, if you'd like to answer, um, ask your question, please do so. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much. I look forward to these uh, Thursdays so much. Uh, and Rachel, I was wondering how you chose the paper that you decide to use uh, and what, what size do they come in? That's a really good question. Um, so expense is something I consider because there's a lot of paper. So I started off um, buying, I think the first installation I did in graduate school, I tried a couple different things, some more expensive papers, but I knew right away that there was no, no way I could underwrite that. So I found uh, a gray paper on a, it was like 36 inches on a 300 foot roll. And I thought, okay, it's like 60 bucks. I was like, I can, I can do that. That's like no problem. So that <laughs> I could do many installations on that roll, but that paper was a little bit cheap. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really like it. And it was a little dark. So I found, uh, it's called line co uh, backing paper. So the paper I'm using, you see in this image right here is actually a paper that is archival and it's made for framing. It's like the paper that you put on, put on the back of a frame when you're you know, framing artwork. I'm not using it the way it's supposed to be used. It's like a light pearl gray. Um, it's a little bit less. I think it's 150 feet, 36 inches. And I think each roll is about 60 or $70. So I can get, I can get a lot of prints out of that. It's pretty economical. And because it's archival, it lasts a little bit longer. It's a little bit heavier than the other paper. And I wish it came in different colors, but it doesn't. It just comes in that color. So that's what I've been using. Um, I actually started printing. I, I found, uh, you know, like peel and stick vinyl that comes on the roll, like people do like this weird wallpaper. Well, you can order that with nothing on it. So I started printing on the peel and stick vinyl as well. And I think that's gonna be just playing with it now. It's really lovely. You can actually paint it um, with like house paint, you know, just like whatever you paint your walls with. Um, and then you can screen print over that. 
and then you can like cut it out, peel and stick it, and then you can glue things to it if you want to expand. So that's another material I've started playing around with. But I, I think like, I don't, I'm not one of these people who like goes to the art store, you know, <laughs> I'm usually like at Home Depot or um, I don't know, finding things in weird places that, you know, that, that I don't know that you that you shouldn't I just I'm not a snob about materials and I feel like whatever works is going to work thank you thank you yeah thank you thank, that was a great great question <laughs> thank you yes thank you Regina and our next question is from the other Elizabeth Elizabeth Tarkovich hi this is this has really been fascinating for me to to listen to you talk about your process and your and your way of handling things um and what i'm interested in is you're a teacher and uh this is a complex amount of things with using a lot of scissors as our as our uh people have seen and heard do you teach this to your students i do teach screen printing to my um advanced graphic design students because the second half of the course is all about printmaking so i introduce them to screen printing and then many students who go on to a, the advanced placement course i actually had a student last year uh this um th she's at sba now um sakura she's very talented um she actually was using screen printing quite a bit um and so students at the school do learn it. And then students who are very inclined, you'll see that students just sort of pick things up and you'll see certain kids have an aptitude for things that it's almost like it's natural for them. So, so there, there are certain kids who show it to them and they're like very excited by the process and they're like, oh, I can do this with it. I can do that with it. And I encourage them to continue. You know, some people do it and they just, I don't know, they just don't have the feel for it. It doesn't interest them. It's like too many steps or something. Um, so yeah, I do teach it. And sometimes students continue on with it, which makes me very, very happy because I think it has a lot of different applications. Thank you, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, that's a great question from one teacher to another or one retired teacher to another. <laughs> um, actually, I have a question, um, Rachel. Um, so history, as, as we've seen so far, is a, a key theme for you. What has it meant to you to exhibit at our two historic houses, as well as in our public libraries? I think those are the most meaningful exhibitions. I love, um, I love historic homes. I love spaces that are unconventional. Um, so you know, exhibiting in the Morris Jamal mansion was really something that happened a little bit last minute and you were actually very helpful um, in encouraging my group to approach the Morris Jamal mansion. Um, and we had originally just asked them to do like a little pop up, which was going to be some artist books, but um, um, Carol, Carol, what's her last name? Carol Ward. Carol Ward, thank you, sorry, it just slipped my mind for a second. Um, Carol offered us a, a whole room and we were able to do a full installation really investigating and going through their archives. So uh, it was a group of artists, Sarah Rowe, Patrick Perry and I, and we each have different areas of interest like Patrick is a metalsmith, um, Sarah works in ceramics and printmaking as well. Um, so, you know, it was really meaningful for us to be able to have access to the archives and to be able to access that that building in a way that felt very, I don't know, felt so special and almost like, um, almost as if we had been given like secret access or something. You know, I remember being there like late at, late at night or late in the afternoon and installing like when the museum was closed and, um, I remember being led around to different rooms that other people didn't have access to. It was like this insider's view of this, this special home. And especially since I had read that, read the book and become interested in Eliza Jamel, it was so meaningful to me. And I was so happy to be there. It was such like a strange experience to inhabit that space in a different way than as a visitor. Um, it was haunting in a way. I really, really enjoyed it. It was very, very cool. Um, and I felt that way also about Wave Hill. 
um, and the New York Public Library, what a great, what a great, what a great public place to exhibit. To put, um, we took a card catalog and had 30 artists respond to something in the collection of the New York Public Library and then put artwork in the drawers of the card catalog. And we installed it in the, sometimes in the children's reading rooms or in like a public space in a library. That project made me very happy. We didn't, you know, you didn't really have to ask permission. You just approached the libraries and they were so thrilled to have you and to have people engaging in a different way and to have art in this very democratic, egalitarian space. So I think those things are incredibly thrilling for me because um, they don't have the artifice and some of the difficulties that comes with showing in an established gallery or a museum. You know, it's like art for the people. It's like very direct. Great. You're, you're, it's almost like your voice changed when, when you started talking about these, these spaces and, and um, how meaningful they've been to you. I noticed that uh, Patrick and Sarah are with us tonight. So if they would like to say a few words, um, this is an invitation for them to do so. Um, not to put them on the spot too, too much, but if they want to, uh, please um, feel free to do so. Yeah, they've okay. been long time. They've been long time um, partners. I met Sarah at Lehman College in I think my first graduate class there, and we've been friends ever since. Um, and Patrick, Patrick is like a, such a gifted artist and metalsmith. Um, and I love working with them as a group. We've done other projects together. We did a project um, in Starlight Park through Bronx River Art Center. That was a big public project. And, you know, they're just really great to have other people to work with. They're like a support system. And I think whenever we're working on anything, even if it's not as a group together, we always run our ideas by one another. And I think that's very important. You know, you need to have this group of people that you can um, kind of lean on a little bit or say, do you think this is a good idea? Or like, how should I make this? Um, and for me, Patrick and Sarah have really been helpful in that way and supportive. And we support each other. You know, when they have a project, I go help them. And they definitely have helped me a lot. So. Sounds like a great trio. Yeah. <laughs> so I think um, that's the wrap uh, for the Q&A. And now I pass the baton to Nidia. Here we go. OK. Can everybody hear me? OK, I think. Yes, we can. <laughs> 